All right, thank you very much. Let's see if I keep you awake for the next few minutes. That's the important thing. So my name is Len Kondrachuk. Um, my, uh, my parents came from a little country. You may have heard about it. I don't know if you have. It's called Ukraine. Um, I grew up in, in, uh, in Boston, and I went in the Army. Well, we got more. We got more coming in. Come on in. I graduated from the Citadel, and I served in the Army for almost 30 years. Let these folks come in. All right, come on in. Come on in. There you go. All right, good. We, we can start again. I was just telling my, my uh, famous biography. And for 10 years, I was a, uh, an armor officer, tanks and artillery. And for 20 years, I was a military historian. Uh, I served at the Army Center of Military History at the National Guard uh, headquarters in the Pentagon uh, Army War College. One of the interesting things I did during the 50th anniversary of World War II, I'd go around the world um, planning the ceremonies uh, for World War II. Um, a lot of trips to France over the years, uh, D-Day, things like that. And uh, I retired, and the National Guard of Massachusetts asked me to come back here to be their historian. They head up there uh, for a while. I was in charge of all the veterans' records. We had a small museum in Worcester, uh, now in Concord. Uh, and that's what I've been doing for the last few years. Also, I was the chairman of the World War I Commission for the state. So we planned World War I activities uh, for the centennial, which ended uh, really this year, uh, in 2017 to 2019. So uh, one of, uh, as a I, I like talking to historical societies uh, and people interested in history because uh, um, hopefully you will get something out of this. And so one of the things I, I, I do is I write town militia histories. And you say, well, what's, what's that about? Uh, the militia was the self-defense force of, of the community uh, in Massachusetts and the colonies. There was no British Army, uh, really, in the, until the French and Indian War in 1755, 1756. So the only protection there was was the uh, homegrown militia. And, and, the, and the colonists, when they came to Massachusetts in the 1630s, Salem 1629, they realized they had to have a protective force against whom? Against the Indians, local Indians, and against uh, any uh, marauding Europeans, namely the French. And so uh, the, the first leaders adopted the uh, English model, which was every man 16 to 60 had, a, had no choice. It was a mandatory military service. You had to, uh, show, you had to have your own weapons. Back then it was a pike, a 20-foot uh, stick with a, uh, with a with a, with a pointy top on it, or it could be something else, a sword. And the early in introduction of, uh, of uh, muskets called uh, snap pants, arquebuses, and finally muskets later on, firearms. The Indians didn't have firearms. So how were they trained? They were trained as to fight European armies, which was a detriment in 1675. In this area, as you know, this was the, the frontier uh, in the 1600s, the, and the uh, King Philip's War, which uh, most Ameri which most people don't know Massachusetts was the largest Indian war in American history in terms of deaths per capita, okay? So more people died per capita in that war than anybody else, both whites and Indians. So it was a devastating war that the Indians realized uh, this was, they were gonna, King Philip, under King Philip's leadership, and all the tribes in this area, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Maine, and so on, uh, ganged up against the, uh, against the whites. And it was fought to the death uh, uh, ended in 1676. But when that war started, the militia was, invo uh, was involved in it, but you couldn't, uh, they, you couldn't take the entire uh, manhood, all the men in the community, to fight the Indians or go off to fight the French. So what they did is they came up with a system of temporary units. Each town had a draft board, even back in the 1600s and 1700s, and they would select the men that would have to go in the, in the temporary battalion, a temporary regiment that would actually fight the Indians, and that's the way the colonial wars were fought. And there were a number of colonial wars. The, you know, the, Brit the British would say to the, to the royal governor, we need troops to fight the French. I was on a, I was on a cruise uh, to the Panama Canal. We stopped in Colombia, Cartagena, Colombia, and the Massachusetts militia fought their, 
uh, in the 1740s in King, King George's War. They all died. They all died of uh, sickness. Not, not one man came back, uh, some 500 men. Was there a man from Bolton in that regiment? I don't know. It could have been. But that's the way they would do it. They would draft the men, and usually they was, obviously they were younger men. They weren't going to take 60-year-olds uh, or 16-year-olds. Uh, they would draft and put in these temporary units, and they were the ones that would go f and fight and protect, uh, protect the colony. Uh, the militia was also a guard force at, you know, during Indian times of Indian raids. Uh, in seven, even as late as uh, 1745, the militia would stand guard at night. That was one of their duties. Um, what else? Um, yeah, that pretty much uh, summed up. They had to show, uh, the drill, drill was, they had to show up for drill or, or training once a month except in the summer. You know, most everybody was a farmer, so they had to tend their crops. Uh, so it was mandatory, you had to show up, and if you didn't have a weapon, the town would, would, uh, would buy you a weapon. Um, and, um, quite, uh, and you can ask, uh, please stop me and ask questions. Uh, you know, if something piques your interest, stop me. <coughs> so the, the, question, the officers and the, and the sergeants were elected by the enlisted men. And so it's always thing, well, were, were these, uh, you know, were these politicians the officers? Well, we, I'd like to think that they elected the captain, the lieutenant, the ensign, and the sergeants as, because maybe they had seen some service in the French and Indian War, which was the case later on during the Revolution. They were uh, important men in the community, especially the local colonel, the major, and so on. Uh, so you like to think they were, uh, um, they were prominent citizens that deserved to be officers. And this is what I generally see in my notes, that you see, you see uh, officers after uh, maybe 5, 10, 15 years service in the militia, uh, elected as, as officers. That, that will change later on. Got one over here. How long did they serve for? Was it a 16 to 60. No, no, not the age group. Yes. How long were they drafted for? Oh, you mean for the provisional companies? Yes. It could be, uh, it, it could be as long as nine months, but generally uh, three months, three to six months. Were they called up again after the first or second time? No, usually if you did one tour for nine months. During the French and Indian War, for example, um, there were three, three units of Bolton men, and that's a good question. There was uh, Captain Timothy Houghton's company of 13 men, 26 in Captain Whitcomb's company. Captain Whitcomb's company served from March to December of 1758. So it gives you an idea how long they had to serve. And, and, and they went to New York, up in you know, upper New York State where, the, where they were fighting the French and then the Indians. Right. Uh, there were, there was, uh, we know there were Bolton men in the Battle of Quebec, when they seized Quebec, the British, uh, 1759. The, uh, these, they were called provincial troops, and the British looked down on the American, American soldiers. They thought they weren't good enough to be soldiers. They were amateurs. A second lieutenant of the British Army outranked a colonel in the pr provincial forces, an American colonel. They didn't have the same rank structure. That rankled, by the way, George Washington. He was a colonel in the Virginia troops, and he had a salute, a second lieutenant of the British Army, he could give him orders. And as a result, George Washington wanted a regular commission. Lucky for us, he didn't. Uh, and so that kind of, and so they were treated as second class troops. And the Bolton men that were Quebec, that battalion, uh, were used as labor troops. They were not, they, they were not considered good enough to be uh, combat troops. But that changes a couple years, a few years later. So I should have mentioned, in 1738, when Bolton becomes a town, one of the first things it has to do, you're required, is to form the militia company, okay? It's, it's, it's approximately 50, 60 men. They have to show up for drill one, uh, once a month. If there's, uh, during wartime, they'd have to drill maybe several times a month. They like the officers, they like the sergeants, uh, and so on. So that's 1738 that the Bolton militia begins. A second company, because the, the population increases, is formed in 1767. So you have two militia companies, approximately over, over 100 men in, uh, in both companies. So I'm not going to go over the, the beginning of the American Revolution, why it all started, but, and, uh, but I will, I will speed, speed up to 1774. In, the, in October of 1774, right down the road on 290 in Worcester, uh, there was a convention, a meeting of all the prominent militia officers of Worcester County. Okay, and among the things they, among the important things they discussed is 
how they were going to take the militia away from the king, away from the royal governor, General Gage. And the way they did that was kind of a revolution. They forced all the loyalist officers to resign. We know that sometimes they'd go right to their home, there'd be a group of them, and they would force that colonel to, to resign his commission, and they would appoint the new colonel. So during that winter, 1774, 1775, all the loyalist officers loyal to the king were forced out. So now you had an, a militia training, where training wasn't very important because there was no threat. If there's no threat, if the French aren't attacking, then the readiness level goes down, people don't pay attention to drill, maybe they don't show up. Well, the militia is re-energized, and they have to show up uh, several times a month to train. But in Worcester, they, they say, we're going to come up with a concept that we've been using since the 1700s to fight the Indians, and it's the Minuteman concept. Well, they've had Minutemen since the early 1700s. These were specially trained militiamen in small units that would uh, screen mostly western Massachusetts. Uh, but in uh, northern Massachusetts as well, certainly in Maine, where they would look for Indians during the winter, make sure there wasn't an Indian attack. So there was, there was a, uh, these were called the snowshoe men, and they had to be ready in a few minutes. So that concept, which hadn't been used, and they knew about Rogers Rangers and the French and Indian War, and so on. So you needed a, you needed a force that was, uh, that was nimble, it could be called up within a few hours, and so they created the Minutemen. The Minutemen were younger men in their 20s, who could uh, drill twice a, twice a week. Uh, they were led by officers uh, that had seen some action. Refer to my notes here. Uh, in the fall of, uh, in Bolton, in the fall of 1774, Captain Benjamin Hastings, who had been a lieutenant in the French and Indian War, was designated as the company, uh, the new third company of militia uh, in Bolton called the Bolton Minutemen. Now, the Minutemen were part of the militia, but they were a special force, special category, well-trained, and they were trained in marksmanship. Now, the British soldier was not trained in marksmanship. He was ordered to pick up his uh, musket and shoot in the general direction of the enemy. Uh, the, the Minutemen were trained marksmen, and they would, uh, as a result, the town, the town of Bolton would have to provide the shot uh, and powder because they went through it so quickly. So generally, the towns had to buy the gunpowder for, for the militia. Well, they did, and for the Minutemen uh, to practice. So during that fall and, and winter of 1774, 1775, Captain Hastings and his Minutemen became pretty good. In fact, they were so good, if you know, uh, the Battle of Bunker Hill, the British officers wore a gorget. It's this gold ornament, a brass ornament, rather, right below the neck. And it was the la last leftover of, of armor of a knight. And it was one of the signs that you were an officer, and, it was, and the uh, officer's servant would actually shine that up real quick, look, make it look nice, bright in the sun. And so our Minutemen were trained to, to aim for that piece of that gorge, and more British officers died at Bunker Hill, that battle, than anywhere else uh, as a result of that Minuteman uh, training. Um, yes? Ah, I'll get there in a minute. <laughs> Actually, I am Paul Revere. Every three years, I ride as Paul Revere. Really? I do. I'm in a, a, a unit called the Nashville Lancers, and one of our missions is to do the rides of Paul Revere and uh, William Dawes. So, yeah, so I'll answer that question in a few minutes as we get to the revolution. That's a good question, though. So at the town meeting on, on 10 April 1775, uh, uh, obviously I re I'm referring to some of the, uh, the, Bolton, the two Bolton histories that are published because I, a lot of these records don't exist anymore. So it's likely that Bolton published that book in 1938. So uh, the towns were even getting ready, uh, preparing the militia. They, so they, they uh, authorized the purchase of 10 muskets. Why is that? Because some of the poorer men in town couldn't afford a musket. Usually these muskets were handed down far to the sun, far to the sun. So some of them were antiquated. Some of them had come back from the French and Indian War. But one of the requirements of a militiaman, a Minuteman, you had to have your own weapon. And if you couldn't afford it, uh, the town, town would buy you one. Of course, uh, you'd have to give it back. But the equipment of a militiaman, of a uh, Minuteman, I should mention that since we're talking about, every militiaman was required to arm and equip themselves with a musket, a bayonet, not everybody had a bayonet, a hatchet, powder horn, knapsack, knapsack, blanket, 
canteen. And as I mentioned, uh, uh, the powder horn, powder horn, the gunpowder was, pur was purchased by the town. Um, let me talk about the other two militia. I talked about Captain, uh, Captain uh, Hastings and the Minutemen. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the, the other militia company was commanded by Artemis Howe. And the, sec and the, uh, the third company was Captain Robert Longley. So three, three companies of militia. And they were assigned to Colonel Whitcomb's regiment of militia of Worcester County. Worcester had like, at that time, 1774, 1775, probably four or five regiments of uh, militia all over the county. Uh, and so the, these were all being trained up. So how many militiamen in Bolton in 1775? At least 150, probably closer to 200 is my guess. Um, Yes, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to that. <laughs> but thanks for reminding me, you know, because I, I, I might skip over it. Uh, um, I got a question. Yeah. Uh, along with all the equipment that they had to have, did they mm -hmm. have to provide their own food? Yes. Because initially, the first day, yeah. And then, and then whatever military force, the regiment, there would be a quartermaster that would have to get the food. Once you're on active... The first day or two, you had to bring your own rations. And you know, we have accounts uh, on the Acton Militia seven, on, on the 19th of April, 1775. The women of the town were preparing all the rations, you know, sandwiches and stuff to put in the knapsacks. Um, so yeah, the first day. But once you're on active duty, it's the, it's the job of the Army to, to, provide, to provide food for you. What kind of food do they consider? Well, it depends. If, if you're on. Uh, if you're on a long active duty time, like the French and Indian War, you know, they'd get meat, they'd slaughter, they'd slaughter cattle and so on. Uh, what did they eat every day? There's a book on the subject. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know what they ate every day. Um, certainly they liked their beer, that's for sure, I know that. Um, on the morning, on the early morning of 19 April, 1775, uh, Paul Revere and William Dawes and other dispatch riders rode out through the countryside. And the, the militia had, a, had a, an alarm system. You know, there were no phones or telegraphs or anything like that, but they knew what's, what, that's what they called an alarm, to ride out. And so uh, the alarm system that went, there was 30, 40 riders that night. Paul Revere wasn't the only one, all over, all over the colony of Massachusetts. And that system had been set up in early 1775, and it was triggered in February of 1775. They thought that the British would be coming out of Boston uh, and, and marching into the countryside, and so that it was a false alarm, but thousands of militiamen were on the march that day before they were told to go back. So they figured out what went wrong. Uh, some towns didn't get the, get the word, but to give you an example, by the morning or afternoon of the 19th, 14,000 militiamen were on the march into Boston. That's how sophisticated that system was. From Maine, New Hampshire, uh, and all of, uh, most of Massachusetts. The, uh, Hampshire, Hampshire, uh, Berkshire counties you know, were marching the second day because they, they got the, the note late. So the entire manpower of Massachusetts was out, all the military manpower some 50,000 men. I, I calculated at one time, if you count all the Massachusetts men in the revolution that, was, that served, it's close to 80 to 100,000. So that means everybody, every man, 16 to 60, did some military service during the revolution. Usually, 80% of them were, was militia, not active duty in the Continental Army. Continental Army, by the way, is the regular army, the full-time force. So on that morning, a prearranged uh, signal uh, sounded in and Bolton. It could have been church bells, three musket shots, could have been drums waking everybody up, but whatever it was, um, the captains alerted their, their, their men. They, they fell in. Is there, there has to be a town green in Bolton somewhere. There's no town. They had to be one once, because that was the training ground, the parade ground for the militia. So wherever, the, somewhere in Probably Bolton there's a training ground. Church in the town hall. Okay, so there, that's where you, mar where you marched and drilled. Um, that's where they formed up. Um, by the way, Paul, what did Paul Revere, 
yell out when he was writing? What do you, what do you think it was? British. Nope. Never said that. Because we're British. We were British at the time. In fact, the English, the British soldiers didn't know what to call us. So they didn't call us Americans. They called us the country people. So what Paul Revere actually and William Dawes and the other 30 writers yelled out is the regulars are out. Alarm the militia. And, and they knew, where the, and in many cases they knew where the captain lived, so they would ride up to his house, pound on the door, tell him, tell him to wake up. So the town history says 127 men responded. Now the actual payrolls for Lexington uh, still exist. It was called the Lexington Alarm that day, by the way, whether you fought and conquered Arlington or the fight back. So the payrolls still exist. So we know the Minutemen had three officers and 55 enlisted men. Uh, Longley's company had three officers and 31 enlisted. Howe's company is not, not recorded, but my guess is somewhere in 30 to 40 to make that 127. Um, so the Bolton men were on the march to Concord. You know, Concord was the big arms depot. That's where they had cannon, they had barrels of, uh, of uh, flour, barrels of gunpowder, shot, all that. So, you know, uh, the expedition was to destroy all of that. They destroyed very little, in fact. Um, so their mission to that was 600 men that came out initially, 600 British men. There was a rescue force of, a, of a 1,200 men waiting for them in Lexington. And all the way back, there, the, the militia companies from all over Eastern Massachusetts were, uh, were attacking the British column on the way back. Question for Mary. Yes. Can I just add that the Great Road out here, 117, was the route that all of these men took on April 15th from Lancaster, Shirley. Um, this was the route they took towards Concord. <coughs> so when you think about this roadway, just think about Men marching from all over, from all over Mass, West, central and western Massachusetts. So the Bolton men did not get in combat. They, they, you know, by the time they got to Concord, Lexington, uh, you know, the British had, had, uh, had escaped, had, had made their way to Charlestown where they ended that day. Um, so there were 14,000 militiamen on the march. They came to Cambridge, some came into Roxbury, and they surrounded uh, Boston put the city under siege. And, you know, you can't have the, like I said initially, you can't have the entire manhood of Massachusetts sitting as an occupying army waiting for the British to come out of Boston. Uh, I, I should mention that um, Howe's company served the longest. They were there, they were in Cambridge for two weeks, and Hastings and Longley's companies were there for eight days and seven days. So. That's what they did. They, they, you know, they had this huge militia army, and uh, there were plans to make it into an, an active duty army, and, th and that's what the uh, colonial, that's what the Massachusetts military leaders did. They decided to form active duty regiments and send those militiamen home that had to be farmers, had to plant the spring crops, the older men. They went home, and they had, from that large forest, you know, and there were. Uh, uh, they created an army of 13,000, so there, obviously there were more than 14,000 militiamen that arrived within the f those few weeks. And they created, they uh, uh, enlisted 13,000 of them. Now, um, the Bolton, there were, you know, there were three militia companies from Bolton, as I mentioned in the, begin you know, in the in beginning of the American Revolution, two minute, one minute man, two militia. And Captain Longley and... Um, Gonna see who I am here. Uh, yeah, and Captain Hastings formed two active duty companies from the Bolton militia. Okay, so they recruit at least 30, you know, a total of 60, 60 men from from Bolton is my guess, uh, and they form these two active duty companies of former militiamen. Most of them were minimen, by the way. Uh, you know, again, they were younger men. Um, probably a second or third brother that was not going to inherit. Uh, the farm, so you know he could be away, and uh, you know they were they were full of they liked military. Well, they were, certainly were patriots, that's for sure, and they they had to have some affinity to military service, otherwise they wouldn't enlist enlist enli enlisted. So they were assigned to Captain, excuse me, Colonel Whitcomb's regiment, which is organized late April. It's authorized on 23 April 1775. 
the regiments were, were, nick, were called after the colonel's names in the British tradition. Uh, so it was uh, Colonel Whitcomb. I, we were having conversation. I don't know if it's as a uh, John, you say it's, I think it's John. probably John. And uh, this is the regiment that was organized from this part of Worcester County, uh, northeast uh, Worcester County. And, it's, and uh, as the older men go home, as the farmers go home, this, this is one of the regiments that stays in, in Cambridge. And uh, uh, Whitcomb's regiment was at the Battle of Bunker Hill. There were 15 casualties, you know, exactly where they were at Bunker Hill, not, not sure. Uh, so we're Bolton men, the first, the first action of the war for them is, uh, is at Bunker Hill. Uh, the reg Whitcomb's regiment, I should mention, stays on on active duty for about six months, and, and the initial enlistments in the Continental Army was only six months, and that was one of the problems during the war. You ne needed an army that was going to be, that you could enlist for a longer period, and finally they go to, to three years. But the regiment is an, is an activator, disbanded uh, right before Christmas in 1775. Of course, the siege of Boston goes on, and I'm sure Bolton militia was called up to go, to, to go in the trenches to surround Boston during that winter of, uh, of 1776. Now, um, talked about, uh, da, 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 da. oh yep. So uh, my guess is, we, we, not a guess, but I'm pretty sure that Bolton men re-enlisted into the Continental Army. Continental Army, by the way, was the army that Congress created on June 14th, Flag Day. It's also the Army birthday on 1775. Congress realized it was going to be a long war, and they had to have a standing or regular army, and they created that army. And they adopted the Massachusetts Army, which was the, the only army they had at the time and, and, uh, outside the Boston area. So when George Washington comes to take command of the army on uh, July 3rd, 1775, in Cambridge, 80% of that army is Massachusetts troops, former Massachusetts militiamen. Later on, the other states slash colonies send their troops up to Boston. Uh, so as I mentioned, the, uh, the Bolton militia companies, uh, they, their main mission during, during the, the revolution was as a training organization. So they weren't called up completely like they were on, uh, on uh, April 19th. Well, what happened is there was a town uh, militia committee, and it was a draft, served as a draft board, and it was usually made up the captains uh, of the town militia and prominent, prominent citizens. They decided who was going to be drafted, and again, it was usually younger men. And these men were, were drafted for service uh, to fight in New York in 1776 at the Saratoga campaign, 1777. Rhode Island campaigns were 1777, 1778. Uh, Captain Longley, who I mentioned, was promoted lieutenant colonel in June of 1776, and he took his regiment uh, to New York uh, to fight the British in New York. So, as I mentioned, virtually all men between the ages of 1740 did some sort of active duty, uh, and at least uh, several hundred men from Bolton served in these temporary regiments. Some of these regiments, just like the French and Indian War, they existed for three months, four months, uh, so Worcester County might provide one regiment that would fight at the Battle of Saratoga in 1777, for example. Um, and that's the way, and George Washington would ask the governors for extra militia during critical campaigns. Was there any kind of, like, deferment or hardship on the draft? And if there was, was there a stigma attached to those who didn't serve? Well, we know, I can't answer that for the Revolutionary War. That's a very good question. They, they weren't going to take... You know, the father with uh, 10 kids that, oh, you know, that are, you know, I'm exaggerating, with a lot of kids. They weren't going to draft him. Uh, but usually they, they drafted, again, and this men who, uh, who, could, who could be away from home without, without uh, hurting, you know, what was going on on their, on their farm or their family. Uh, so that's, that's a very good question. The only time that's ever been looked at is the, the drafting of men in, in during King... Phillips War in 1675. Um, so I, I can't answer that question. I don't know. It was a local thing. So the whole, the whole concept of, of draft starts in the colonial era, and it becomes federal law during the Civil War and then really during World War I. I imagine sole surviving sons. Well, uh, yeah, 
And, uh, and uh, I don't know. I can't answer that. But uh, certainly there were a lot of young men that could, you know, that, well, what happened, the town would get, um, the town would get notification from the local colonel, we need five men for this regiment. And they'd have to come up with the five men. They would ask for volunteers, no volunteers, then they would draft. I find it, it's interesting you talk about their, their drafting for three months or six months. You know, we tend to think that there were so many battles in World War I, World War II, blah, 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 within that period. But it took two months to walk to Saratoga. It, t it took a while, that's right. So they were not yeah. really in battle all that long. No, there wasn't. No. And of course, you know, uh, the typical militiaman, you know, he's, he was told he was going to be on, on active duty for three months. And by George, it was uh, on the 90th day, he was heading back home. Um, and George Washington, you know, as much as he, uh, and he, and he, there was a famous uh, paper that he wrote about the, the, it's like a broken reed. You can't depend on the militia. They come and they go, then they eat up all your food, and then they want to go home. But he couldn't have fought the, the American Revolution would not have been won without the, without the militia. Why is that? The critical reinforcements of the Continental Army. And the other thing, they drove the loyalists out of the, out of the communities and out of the state. So they were like, they were a protective force at home watching for any loyalist. And this was important, not so much in Massachusetts where the loyalists left in droves, but in the South, you know, in the South it was 50-50. So the, the historians usually say during the American Revolution, the population was, uh, was a third pro-patriot, third loyalist, and a third neutral. Uh, but the, the, the important part of the militia is they, they kept, they kept uh, the state uh, as part patriotic. Yes, ma'am? How did you know someone was a loyalist? How would they know you're loyal? They knew. They knew. They knew. They knew. <laughs> <Yeah>. they knew. <laughs> it's not like you wore a big L, but every, they, they, it was well known. No secret votes in your There was, no, they, it was well known who was for the king and who was, who was, who was for the revolution. <coughs> So yeah, it was not, no secret. And so the loyalists, the loyalists either had to take, somebody would come, you know, there'd be a group come to your house and say, uh, you're not a loyalist anymore, right? Put a gun, to your, a gun to your throat. And they said, oh, no, no. And they had to actually write out a piece of paper saying, I'm no longer a loyalist. Uh, and if you were, you were forced out of town. You just left. Yeah, you just left. And, they, and your property was seized. You went to Canada? Well. Yeah, eventually. Yeah, you know, I, this is funny. Uh, my, my wife's Canadian, and uh, uh, and I, you know, I study the military history of all countries, but Canada. And I, I tell most Canadians, like Americans, don't know their own history. I said, you know, why you guys speak uh, American English and not British English? And they said, no, nah, we don't know. I said, because Canada was founded by Americans, and they go nuts when I when I say that. But the Loyalists moved to New Brunswick and uh, Nova Scotia. Those from Massachusetts, and then uh, when Ontario opened up, Ontario was settled by, uh, by, by Americans. In fact, there's a, a regiment in the Canadian Army called the Royal American Regiment, uh, made up of loyalists from Massachusetts. Someday, could you do a, a segment on militia in the Civil War, which would be very interesting. I will mention briefly only today. Uh, I, do I still, I have, we started late, so I'm still fighting the revolution. <clears throat> Okay, uh, yeah, all right, I'll skip a little bit. So the war ends in 1783, and uh, you know, the Constitution, we have to draft the Constitution, 1787. And the Constitution is important <clears throat> because the Founding Fathers decide that we're going to have a small standing army and a very large militia, okay? They didn't like regular armies because they, the British Army had 10 regiments in Boston and were the policemen of Massachusetts. And they saw the uh, standing army as a threat to a free uh, democratic nation. So, uh, but in the Constitution it says the militia has, has two missions. Uh, one is a state militia under the governor, but the president can call a militia. Now we call a militia the National Guard. And, and in, right in the Constitution it says the militia can be called up for, uh, for invasions if someone invades us. Uh, to suppress riots and uh, to enforce the law. So the, so the militia now has two missions, and that continues in the National Guard of today. The National Guard is both a state force 
and when the president calls him, becomes part of the active duty army as its, as its federal mission. So that starts right in 1787. So they realize, they, they, Congress realizes they have to, if they're going to have a militia with federal responsibilities, 1792, there's a Militia Act that now says, under the federal government, orders the states to train their militia according to the discipline of Congress, <coughs> whatever that is, that's part of the problem. But all men, 17 to 45, have to be in the militia. So again, it's not a voluntary force. Even after the revolution, state and federal law says you have to show up for drill once a month, provide your own weapons, or, uh, and, and carry out your civic responsibility as a citizen soldier. Uh, Massachusetts says, okay, three times a year you have to show up in May, where we're gonna have an inspection of the militia, and two drills in, uh, in the fall. The officers are elected again. Uh, we like to think, and in most cases they are uh, veterans of the, of the American Revolution, so you have an officer corps that did see some active service. Again, they're prominent, the colonels and the majors, I mentioned some of their names and, and, and you know them. There's a Major Oliver Barrett, Jr. That's uh, a major in the 1st Regiment. The Lieutenant Colonel Commander Caleb Wheel in 1819, for example, all come from Bolton, Major Joshua Sawyer in 1820. All are leaders in, in, uh, in the Bolton Militia. There's one company, it goes on to one company. It's assigned to the 1st Regiment of the 2nd Brigade of the 7th Division. The Massachusetts Militia is huge. Counting Maine, it has 13 infantry divisions. It's huge. Uh, I like to say, are they well-trained, well-equipped? Well, we know that they were equipped. You know, I have, I have records in the archives saying they can count the number of bayonets, muskets, and so on. Uh, there's some discipline initially after the war. Uh, the militia, it's like anything else in American history when it comes to American uh, <coughs> military history. If there's a threat, if there's a foreign threat, then the militia says, oh, it's pretty serious. Let's, we better do some training. We, om we almost went to war against France in 1797, 1798, called the Quasi War. Uh, so the militia readies up. Also in 1807, the Massachusetts, 10,000 men of the Massachusetts militia alerted for immediate service to fight the British. It looked like we were going to war in 1807. Uh, so, as the threat goes up, the readiness goes up. As the threat goes down, militia really isn't that good. But with this uh, mandatory militia called the enrolled militia, where you had to enroll at the age of 17, there's a new militia being created uh, called the volunteer militia. So you now you have two kinds of troops. Like the ones that don't want to be in it, but they have to be in it. And a group that likes to be soldiers, they drill more often, they wear uniforms, uh, I did see the photograph of the, of the Shaco, the Bolton rifles, for example, it's in a uh, photograph. And I'll talk about the Bolton rifles in a minute. So this volunteer militia is a group of men in their 20s and 30s who have the means to purchase fancy uniforms to drill several times, you know, have musters, training assemblies uh, several times uh, a month. Um, they take part in all the civic and patriotic activities in the town. And the key is to have a fancy uniform. Fancy uniform attracts recruits and wife, and if you see, uh, and if it's a real fancy uniform, it attracts the women as well. And that was one of the reasons why some of these uniforms were, like, were quite ostentatious. Not only because it was the mode of the time they had fancy uniform, but it actually had a recruiting uh, appeal. So the first volunteer unit in Bolton is a cavalry troop. It shares it with, uh, um, so uh, Bolton in 1800, uh, forms a cavalry troop. They have uniforms, they drill, they have horses. Uh, and in the cavalry, you're seen as a cut above the, the plodding infantrymen. So it's obviously men who could afford to buy, to buy a saber, to have a, a nice saddle, to buy a little blue jacket or something like that. Uh, so it was, little, was a, a cut above everybody else. And of course, you had to bring your own horse. So this Bolton troop is uh, organized in 1800. Um, <laughs> Since I'm talking about it, <clears throat> Captain Azo Whitcomb, must be the son, must be the junior, uh, forms the troop in 1800, 1802 he's elected as the major, in 1805 he's elected as the colonel. And that regiment serves in this local area and the, the Bolton troop is disbanded in 1828. I'll, I'll mention why in a minute. Another volunteer militia unit here in Bolton you may not be aware of is the artillery company. Uh, also organized around 1800, 
And it was made up not only of Bolton men, but men from the surrounding area. They had, a, they had uniforms. The state would give them two cannon to practice. The powder house is built in uh, 1812. Right, for the, to keep the gunpowder for the cannons. Usually, if they had two cannons, which they did, they had to build a gun house, a shed, to keep the cannon. So a town could have a powder house and a, and a gun house as well. Uh, that's where the, the, uh, the gunpowder was stored. Is the one in Bolton still exist? Yes. Right up here behind the town. Okay, yeah, there's still some that still exist. Uh, they, were, they were built under the direction of the Quartermaster General of Massachusetts, and uh, there's only a few of them left. Interesting, okay. One other interesting thing, <clears throat> before the powder house was built, <clears throat> the ammunition was stored underneath the pulpit in the meeting house. Probably because nobody would think of going there. Exactly. <laughs> an, outside, an outside force, yeah, very good. Get my notes there going. Oh, question. One more thing about the powder house is uh, it is built from bricks that were um, made in Bolton along the Still River Road by the Howard family. So the War of 1812 breaks out in 1812, lasts till 1814 was not a popular war in Massachusetts. Uh, it was, in fact, there was a uh, convention in Hartford opposing the war between the New England states. It was seen more as a southern war. And so Massachusetts does not take a role in the war, uh, except to protect the, coast and, uh, protect the city of Boston in 1814 and the coast. And the Bolton militia was not called up. Um, but in, eight, in October of 1819, the Bolton Rifles was organized at, as its third Volunteer Militia Unit, so, there, at this, so at this point there's four Bolton Militia Companies, or partial Militia Companies from Bolton. Uh, so you can see there's an interest in artillery and cavalry, and now the Bolton Rifles. What does that mean? Uh, did they carry rifles? Uh, a rifle is a new type of weapon introduced uh, during the American Revolution, the Kentucky Rifle. The British Army rifle units, rifle regiments adopted during the Napoleonic Wars the idea of rifle units came over from Europe. Uh, they wore green uniforms. The Bolton Rifles wore green uniforms. The British Army regiments wore green, they wore rifles. Uh, and they, uh, so it was, a, a, I understand it had yellow trim on it, and you have that shako. The shako is uh, the hats that the West Point cadets wear on, on parade, that's called a shako. And you had a plume, you had some sort of uh, helmet device, or maybe not on the helmet, but it made you appear taller than you were. They wore white trousers in the summer, and they probably wore green trousers in the winter. And this is the Bolton Rifles are the ones that, that you know, fired the weapons, uh, the salutes of the 4th of July, took part in the parades. But it was an early, it was also a men's club. The volunteer militia was a men's club because it was like the Lions Club or whatever of its masons of its period. Now, if you weren't drilling, uh, you, you know, you'd, you'd have a, a meeting of the organization, not military, but you'd elect officers, they would plan dances, uh, things like that. So it was very popular to, uh, to belong to that. Now, it was part of the attraction of, of joining the volunteer militia. It was a social and a military organization at the same time. Um, <clears throat> so at, at, the end of the, at the end of the War of 1812, the militia here in Massachusetts starts dying off. They hadn't been called up to any great degree during the war. Uh, you know, the, the men are thinking, why do I have to do this? It's silly, I have to show up three times a year, uh, you know, go through the election, I make, you know, go left, right, they drill a little bit. And uh, the interest is really going down, uh, and not only in Massachusetts, but uh, other states as well. Um, in 1838, Captain Jonas Holman sends his resignation as commander of the Bolton Militia Company um, as captain. He was captain for nine months, service in the militia for 10 years, and he states in his resignation letter that, quote, the state of the company is such that it renders it impossible to elect new officers. For the reason, I am moving to another part of the country, end quote. He resigns his commission, and the Adjutant General in Boston says, that's the end, says, if you can't collect the officers, then that's, we're going to disband the unit. So the Bolton militia disbanded 1838. The Bolton rifles disbanded in 1835. They, they can't keep up their membership. And in 1840, all town militia companies 
the mandatory militia, the enrolled militia, are all, dis all disbanded in Massachusetts. The Plymouth Company, organized in 1621, disbanded. The Boston Company, six Boston Companies, 1630, disbanded. In their place, uh, the volunteer militia company, companies now become regiments. They're designated as the Massachusetts Volunteer Militia. It's 6,000 men are in the force, artillery, infantry, some cavalry. Um, and it's this militia, well-equipped, and I won't say they're well-trained, but partially trained uh, enough to, to be competent, um, get called up by the president uh, on April 15, 1861. They report for duty in Boston, the rendezvous uh, camp at Faneuil Hall uh, the next day, April 16th. And the first units, the first regiments to leave Massachusetts are on April, two days later, April 17th. They're on the way to Washington. We could not do that today. There are no, you can't, there's no Minutemen armies today any, anymore. It takes days, weeks, months to send an army overseas uh, or to demobilize and uh, to go overseas. So it's a remarkable achievement. The Massachusetts Volunteer Militia Regiments are the first ones to arrive in Washington. In fact, one of the regiments is, uh, there's no barracks or anything, so they're housed in the, in the Capitol, for example. Uh, and President Lincoln greets them, the 6th Regiment, which is from, which is, uh, from Northeast Middlesex County. Um, so there was no military activity in Bolton until 1861. On 6 May 1861, town committee here in Bolton uh, is committed to raising a volunteer company for the Massachusetts Volunteer Militia. The idea that they would form this company and they would march off as, a Bol as the Bolton Company uh, to represent the town in the beginning of the, of the Civil War. Uh, it's a great idea. They approved 30 days pay, $13 a month. That's what a soldier gets back then. They uh, purchased, they agreed to purchase uniforms. They agreed to, to hire a drill master and um, Great ideas, nothing happens. There is no Bolton company in the Civil War at this point in 1861. Why? I, the only reason I can come up with is that, um, is that perhaps Bolton men are uh, waiting to join the three-year regiments, which we're recruiting at the same, you know, approximately the same time. And that's what they did. The Bolton men that served in the Civil War they served in 20 different regiments. There's no, uh, this is 1861. They just enlist everywhere. There's a vacancy, they, they join. So there's no Bolton uh, history as a unit uh, until 1862. In 1862, in the spring, the war is not going well for the Union. President Lincoln calls for emergency troops, he calls for 300,000 militiamen to be ordered to active duty for nine months. Um, it's critical that the and these militia troops are needed to reinforce the, uh, the Army of the Potomac everywhere that the Union is fighting. So the Massachusetts Volunteer Militia <clears throat> responds by sending existing and new regiments to active duty. And many of the vol uh, Massachusetts Volunteer Regiments serve in the Union enclave in, uh, on the coast of North Carolina. Uh, in 1862, a Union expedition captures the North Carolina coast around New Bern and most of the troops that garrison that are from Massachusetts. And so the Massachusetts militia show is, uh, is sent to keep that uh, enclave uh, safe from the Confederacy. Uh, the 5th Regiment is called up. It's ordered to muster in September of 1862 for nine months. There was a vacancy for Company I in Bolton, in the, town, the towns of Bolton and Marlboro, uh, volunteered to, to organize, tra train, equip, recruit. Company I of the 5th Regiment, the Massachusetts Volunteer Militia. Captain Charles Newton of Bolton and First Lieutenant Andrew Powers of Bolton are appointed by the governor to recruit the company, 20 men enlist. And as I look at the enlistment rolls, I can see most of them are shoemakers. It's the largest uh, profession job in Bolton at the time. The second is farming. Um, so the 5th is mustered, some brief training. And then they go off to North Carolina, New Bern, North Carolina, in uh, late of October 1862. It was like five other Massachusetts uh, militia regiments. They saw some brief action in November, December. Wasn't a lot of fighting. Um, some action in 1863, 
uh, in the spring of 1863, and their nine months is over, and they say, we're going home, and the federal government releases them. They come back to Bolton uh, early July of 1863 as the Bolton Town Militia Company, and they're disbanded. And that is the end of the militia in Bolton. And that's the end of my remarks, unless there are any questions. <laughs> So a brief history of the Bolton Militia, 1738 to 1862. I have something. It's so interesting hearing you talk about militia. While we have all these gun things today, we talk about the Second Amendment with that word in it. That's right. I mean, the Second Amendment was, the way I interpret it as a military historian, it was for the militiaman to have a weapon, and for a militiaman to have a, you have to be in the militia. A militia is a you know, the militia got a bad, bad connotation now. Militia means a citizen soldier force organized by the government. It's not a bunch of yahoos in Montana and uh, Idaho running around with guns uh, wearing fatigue uniforms. That's not a militia. So it's a bad connotation. So to me, the Second Amendment is it's a, it's a, a means for a citizen soldier to be guaranteed to have a weapon and why is that? Because the militia was seen as a check against the central government, or a standing regular army that could revolt and take over and uh, seize demo and you know end democracy in Massachusetts or in the nation. So nice that's my explanation. It'd be nice to see it rewritten and spelled out. Supreme Court has got got it several times and they got it wrong. If you read, if you look at American history, so yeah. good good question. Yes. They disbanded also in 1820, 1828. They left. Yeah, so every, everything's gone. Uh, so the last, by 1838, except for that brief Civil War unit. <laughs> so, um, yeah, Bolton does not get a militia, uh, you know, does not, it's not large enough to get, a, to get a National Guard unit, you know, sometime in the modern period, uh, so. But these surrounding towns. Right, they did. Uh, Worcester, is a, uh, Worcester got many, large units in its, in, its, in its history. So I didn't look to see where Bolton men enlist in the Spanish-American War, World War I. Even, even though I have those records. The Spanish-American, there weren't many. Yeah, there weren't many. World War I yeah, generally, yeah, generally if you had a, a National Guard unit, militia unit in your town in 1898, uh, that's, where, that's where they joined because the war was fought largely by the National Guard that's not well known. Same thing with World War I. Uh, the, uh, the early guys joined the National Guard because they know they're going to war with their town buddies. Uh, and then, of course, the draft kicks in in September of 1917. Uh, and, and my records <coughs> are under my partial control. One of my missions was to have a, a listing of all uh, town, all veterans of the town. That's, uh, that's one of the requirements that's laid uh, by, uh, by state law on, on my office. And we have records on, um, by town, of who served where from 1898 to the present. So we have rosters for Spanish-American War, World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam. The, the ones, the best ones, are the ones that were typed after World War I. After that, it's, it's a computer listing that's not very good. But if anybody ever wants to know <coughs> who served, uh, those records are, are, are still available. We're the only state until recently that could do that. Three million men and women have served in the armed forces from Massachusetts since 1775, by the way. So it's a large number. <clears throat> my, my voice is giving out as well. So are, are there any other questions? Am I delaying lunch? No. Only by a couple minutes. All right. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. <clears throat> Appreciate it.